that we never hide ourselves from the presence of God. That we never feel like we need to run from the presence of God. Because what Jesus did on the cross by shedding his blood said all are welcome who believe in me. Despite what you have done, despite what you have not done, despite how wicked it was, he said all who believe in me are welcome because of the blood of Jesus. So let me tell you, you never have to try to run from the presence of God. You have to get honest with God and honest with yourself and honest before him and let his presence saturate you and change you. God said they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Let me tell you something. The only person you're fooling is yourself if we think we're hiding from God. Because he said, where, where can I go? If you make your bed in hell, I'm there. If you make your bed in heaven, I'm there. Wherever you go, you cannot run from my spirit. I am there. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, where art thou? Now, we know the Lord knew exactly where they were at, but it's a relationship. He wanted a response from his people, his creation. That's right. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Fear will keep you out of the presence of God. Our misperception of what, who God is, thinking that he's a harsh taskmaster, thinking like the prodigal son, I cannot go back to the father's house because I've spent too much time in this circumstance. I've, I've, I've lived right, rightlessly. I have lewdly lived and I have spent my inheritance and I, I can't go back to the presence of the Father. Well, that is a lie from the pit of hell. No matter what, you can always come to the Father because the Father is watching and he's looking for his children to come back into his presence because in his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence are pleasures forevermore. In, in his presence is cleansing and washing and freedom. In his presence is sanctifying and the changing power of God. It's the enemy that wants to keep you out of the presence of God. It's the enemy that would try to get you to clean yourself up and hide yourself. Listen, you're not fooling anyone, anyone when we come into the presence of God with our Christianese and our church face on. We're not fooling anyone. He's saying... I want my people to get real with me. I want my people to come in and say, you know what, Lord? I have doubted you, but help my doubt and unbelief. He wants his people to come in and say, I have royally blew it. But God, I know that you're able to deliver what I give you today. What I commit into your hands, you're able to handle. Listen, when Pam was up here and she began to weep and she began to wail in the presence of God, don't ever get uncomfortable with that. Come on. Amen. God desires a broken spirit and a contrite heart. He said he will not despise. Amen. When she's here doing that or any of us are there doing that, he's like, yes, my child. Yeah. Yes, my child. Yes, my child. You can break. In the presence of God. Amen. He actually desires it. Amen. Because at that moment of surrender, he says, okay, now I can work with you. Yes. Now, oh clay, says the potter, I can change you. Now I can do what I will with you. Because when we're trying to do it all ourselves and run from the presence of God and, and make ourselves into something, he can't work with clay that is stubborn. God, help us to have the right perception of you so that we know we can come into the presence of God. Amen. He said, I hid myself. And verse 11 says, he said, who told you that you were naked? Has thou eaten from the tree I commanded thee not to eat? And man said, the woman you gave me. 
That's what Jeff says. <laughs> and she gave me of the tree and I did eat. We're always blaming someone else, aren't we? Yeah. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. And I did eat. I want to skip down to verse 15 where it gets good. And I will put enmity between me and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And I got excited because I looked up in the Hebrew what that word bruise means. And that word for bruise means to snap or to break. Amen. To snap or to break. And in the beginning, God was saying, I am going to break every tactic and scheme of hell that has come against your life. I am going to send my son. He was, he was prophesying. I am going to send my son to die on Calvary that I would send the head of the serpent. I would snap the head of the devil. It is finished. It is done. He said it in the beginning of the book. He said it in the middle of the book. When he said it is finished on the cross and he said at the end of the book that we win. That we win. So read the book. So you know what you actually have. And you know what's to come. Because if we're not in the word of God and we do not understand what we have in Christ, then guess what? We're going to get beat up from left to right. And it's hard enough when you do know. Right, brother? But if we're ignorant to the things of God, then it's even worse. God, help us. Help us, oh God, to understand your ways. So what I want to talk to you today about is the destruction of relationships. The enemy is out to destroy, one, the family unit. Right, right. Yes. As we see here in the book of Genesis. Two, marriages. Relationships between the parents and the children. Friendships. Church families. Yes, yes. Okay? He's out to destroy. He's also, ultimately, out to destroy your relationship with the father. That word beguiled means to be led astray, to be mentally deluded. That means that in our mind I am misled and that my judgment is off. To be seduced or persuaded, listen, the enemy wants to persuade or convince you to disobey or be disloyal through false promises. He promises you it's going to be one way. He promises you things that are false, and then it's in order to get you to disobey or be disloyal to the word of God or to the Father. And if we are disloyal to the Father, then we our relationships around us will be broken down. There's a breakdown. In the family, there's a breakdown in the marriage, there's a breakdown in the friendships, there's a breakdown in the church house, there's a breakdown in our businesses, there's a breakdown because the enemy is constantly trying. If he can't get you, he'll get him. If he can't get them, he'll get the children. If he can't get him, and he's constantly trying to delude and get our judgment to be off. But the spirit of God that's in you is greater than the enemy, and he wants to give you eyes to see every tactic and scheme that's coming your way. Yeah, yeah. It is our job to be watchmen. If you knew the enemy was coming and you knew that, uh, that there was an army that was coming to come to your household, to come to the church house, to come to your business, you would not be passively watching. You wouldn't just go check the door every now and again. You would be aggressively pursuing, knowing that the enemy is coming in, he's on his way, and I am watching. I am going 
going to protect the inheritance which God has given me. He has given me these children. He has given me this business. He has given me these friendships. He has given me this church house. Pastor Matt's not the only watchman in this church. You are called to be watchmen. You are. He can't watch everything. He's one man. You are to watch. You are to protect. You are to defend. One of the best, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is when there's the pea patch. And he's supposed to be defending his pea patch. And the Philistines keep coming in and stealing from the pea patch. And, they, and it keeps happening. And one day he stands up and he says, I'm not going to let you steal from my patch any longer. We as the church of God have to stand up and say, I'm not going to let the enemy take from my children any longer. I'm not going to let the enemy take from my friendships any longer, from this church any longer. I'm going to defend the faith. I'm going to defend the patch. And you do it through prayer. You do it through speaking truth. You do it through lifting each other up. Not. Listen, don't help the enemy yes. by destroying one another with our words and our deeds. Don't help him. Don't just hand them to him. We fight. We're meant to fight for one another. The enemy wants to cause destruction, which is the action or the process of causing so much damage to something that it's as though it never existed. Listen to what I'm saying to you. The point of the enemy, his character, is to destroy something so much and cause so much damage. I'm talking about relationships with people, with God, with each other. He wants to cause so much havoc that it would be as though that relationship with that person never existed. With your spouse, mm. with your children, yeah. with God, yeah. as though it never existed. Mm. That's the character of the enemy. Mm. I want to talk to you about how the enemy works within relationships. I want to be able to pinpoint and to discern and recognize the enemy's character when he's coming in. Don't you? Don't we want to be ready for battle? If I put you in a UFC ring, I think you would prepare. I wouldn't want to go in there. You get ready. You'd be doing your push-ups and eating your Wheaties. Right? You'd be getting ready like, oh. You'd be doing all you can to prepare for that fight. And we as Christians... We just go about our everyday, oh, Jesus save me for the Lord, oh, Lord. hallelujah. <laughs> wow. Pay my tithes. <laughs> oh, hey, sister, how you doing? I did my good deed for today. I helped so-and-so. I picked them up to go to church. But yet, but yet, we're not preparing in our hearts. Amen. The next thing you know, all of a sudden the enemy sweeps us off our feet. We have no sword to fight with. We haven't been standing on the word of God. We have no prayer life. We haven't been entering into worship any other time but on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. We have no preparation. We don't know how to get through. Look, I love this church. This is my church family. I love it here. But I can't just take Pastor Matt and everybody with me everywhere I go. Come on, man. I can't bring y'all into the gym where I work. I can't bring y'all into the funeral home where I work. I love to bring y'all to Mississippi. We could just pick up the church. And like, <laughs> that'd be wonderful. But I can't do that. So there's something in your relationship with God that you need to get on your own. I'm just speaking truth to y'all. Because I want to defend the patch. And this is a part of the patch that God has given me. And I want to not be ignorant when the enemy comes in and tries to disrupt and destroy and dismantle. 
God wants to do that in leadership in the church. He wants to do that with the music ministry. He wants to do that in your business. He wants to do that with your friendships. He wants to do it all the time. It's a constant, 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 constant. And if you're not, if you're, if you're not discerning, then you're not going to know, and you're just going to be looking at everyone. It's a woman you gave me. It's a pastor you gave me. That pastor, Pastor Matt. Oh, it's Naya. Oh, now I gotta figure out how to worship. We lead that worship team. She doing a horrible job at it. No, it's like that's my bestie. You better be nice to her. It's that boss you gave me. It's that coworker you gave me. It's that ex you gave me that I still got to have contact with. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> it's that friend you gave me, Lord. Ooh, y'all should see me at night sometimes. We know we besties, but boy, it can get hot at times. But the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Yes. 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 See, we are, we're, we're supposed to be sharpening one another. That means we get ready for something. Yeah. Right, Pastor yeah. Matt? Yeah. Me and Pastor Matt had our fair share of sharpening. <laughs> we sure did. But God has continuously refined and renewed and got us ready. And neither of us quit and neither of us said, well, to heck with you. you can, don't quit on your people. Don't quit on what God is giving you. Don't quit on the relationship. Look, Jeff and I sure know how to refine one another. Ooh, wait till you get married and you get a spouse. Oh, a whole nother level of death. But life too. But life too. But we know how to sharpen one another. But you know what? That's because God is preparing us to protect the patch right there, them two, right there, that third one back there. We got another one we're protecting in Meridian. And God is preparing us to protect our patch, what God has given us. And he's using our relationship with one another to sharpen each other and get each other sharp and discerning yeah. that we're able to see. No, that's a tactic yes. from hell. It's coming against our family yes. and our inheritance. Yes. And I would have been able to see it unless he used the vessel to sharpen yes. people. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. Oh, yes. we better start looking at each other as some tools in the shed that we all need. Yes. Yes. We need it. Yes. We need it. We need to be ready. Get ready. Yes. Listen, it's only getting worse. That's right. I mean, I, I am sometimes amazed at the things I see on social media and the things I see. One of the things I saw was a drag queen reading to children. And I was like, why are we just handing our children over? Wow. We're just like, we're not even like trying to defend our kids any longer. We're just like, here you go. Mm -hmm. Serving them up on a silver platter. God is God, not pleased with that. Oh, he is not oh, pleased with yeah. that at all. He, and we're just handing them over to idols, to devils, to demons. We're handing them over. Look, this is real. Oh, amen. Yeah. This is real. You defend your children. You defend what they look at, what they listen to. Amen. You defend what they watch, what they see, who they're around. Yes. Yes. You defend them. You defend your friendships. Right. Like if I saw tell Danielle, you saw, I see Danielle going, going down a one-way street the wrong way. I'm going to tell her, Danielle! Amen. Amen. Going the wrong way! Reach. We should be defending one another, right. standing for one right. another. Even your spouse. Now, you use grace, right, Jeff? Grace. <laughs> but you tell one another. When you see something. They're falling into a hole. You're going to pull them out. Because you love one another. Why do we treat each other differently in the church house? Amen. I just want to let y'all know God put y'all here together. Amen. That's it. Amen. I mean, y'all are going to be here together. <laughs> so y'all better just buckle in. Amen. Buckle in and allow God to sharpen you. Amen. Listen, the girl on this side of the church ain't always thinking about what you're doing over there on the other side of the church. So if she rolled her eyes, guess what? She might have just had a bad morning. That's right. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, I've done that before. I've been standing over there like, you see the way she's looking at me? 
She ain't even thinking about you. That's right. She's thinking about what she's going through. And we do that a lot. Oh, did you, she didn't even say hi to me. They didn't say hi to me. You didn't care who said hi to you in the world. And I'm from New Jersey. We got blinders on. We don't talk to nobody. But all of a sudden, I'm saved. And Danielle didn't say hi to me. And now all of a sudden, the enemy is coming in and bringing division and dissension within the church. And now all of a sudden, I'm telling Naya, can you believe that Danielle didn't say hi to me? <laughs> and now all of a sudden, Naya looking at Danielle with a twisted eye. <laughs> And he and she's the pastor's wife. Come on, I'm just I'm preaching real truth here because this is what the enemy does. And Danielle, I've never said that, and I love you very much. And she always gives the best hugs. But that's what the enemy does. Yes, it is. To try to distort your view of each other. To drive you out from where God is moving. That's right. See, Adam was trying to hide from the presence of God because he didn't understand that God was going to be able to forgive him. So he's trying to cover up his sin. But God said, no, I want you to come and bring it to me. I want to talk to you about the overcoming power of God. So we have... The destruction of the enemy in relationships. How to pinpoint that destruction and then the overcoming power of God. Because there's always hope and there's always life yes. and there's always victory. I'm not going to leave you with the tactics of the enemy and not give you a way to fight. Amen. God said in the book of Genesis... We see God as the master designer. We see him as a master creator. We see him creating heaven and earth. God in relationship with his creation. But then we see following that God created Adam and he created Eve. And we see the institute of marriage here. Genesis 2.23, if you put that on the board, Genesis 2.23, the Bible says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. God is all about unity. Yes. Why am I bringing that up? Because you are the bride of Christ. Amen. And he is your master and he is your groomsman. And he, when you give your heart to the Lord, you are now married to Christ. Now you are one in Christ. So now you are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. You are one with him. You are in unity with the Spirit of God. Because now the Spirit of God moves on the inside of you. That word unity means that you are one with something. But if I go on to see the officiation of this marriage between Adam and Eve, God gives instructions to them and says, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave, Unto his wife, and they shall be what? One flesh. Amen. But as I began to think about this in the state of the bride of Christ and the, and the state of the groomsman, God as the master groomsman, then I started to begin to think about this. That we are, as his bride, to leave, to relinquish and forsake all, just as he instructed Adam and Eve, and cleave, that means adhere to, join with, be in pursuit of Christ. You are to relinquish and forsake all and cling to the master. Oh, yes. You are to relinquish and forsake all. That was the problem with the man who had riches. And he said, what must I do yes. And he to be saved? And he said, well... I want you to forsake all, and I want you to follow me. And it says that that man walked away sorrowful. Why? Because he wasn't willing to give up what God was asking him to give up. God is asking us.
us today. And I don't know what it is. I don't need to know what it is. And it could just be an attitude we have. It doesn't have to be anything great grandiose. But he is saying this to you this morning. I want you to relinquish that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to let go of that. Even if it's us trying to make something happen. Yeah. Trying to figure something out. Trying to make it happen. God's saying, no, relinquish it. Give it to me. Yeah. Give it to me. Forsake it. Give it to me. I got it. My hands created heaven and earth. My hands are big enough to handle your situation and hold you up at the same time. God is saying, I want you to relinquish it. I want you to forsake it. I want you to give it to me. And I'm not going to leave you empty handed. I want you to cling. Cling to me. Cling to what I have done for you. Cling to the fact that my peace is here. Cling to the fact that I have freedom. Cling to the fact that I am deliverer. Cling to the fact that I am your forgiveness. Cling to the fact that I am your father. I am your provider. I am your friend. Cling to that. Amen. Don't give up on that. Yeah. Be one with me. God's character is all about wholeness and harmony and oneness. He doesn't want division and dissension among you. Forsake all and be in constant pursuit of Jesus. So then we go on in the story to see this, that, that they were abiding in the Garden of Eden. Eden. This was their home and there was no sin nature there. There was no sin nature that we have to deal with there. And in Genesis 2, 8, it says the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that was pleasant to the sight, good for food. And in this garden he put the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And sometimes we could say, well, why would he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there? Like, if... He knew they were going to mess up, right? That's right. He gave us a free will. Yeah, and he said, you have a free will to love me, to serve me, to pursue me, to hear me, to believe me, to trust my word, to trust what I have spoken to you, or you have a free will to walk away. I know that's not taught very much, but that's truth. You have the ability to forsake the Lord and cling to another. Mm. That's called adultery mm. and fornication. Mm. Come on. In the spirit. Amen. And God is saying, no, I want, you, I want you to come. I want you to come because I have put the tree of life in the midst of the garden. I have, I have died on Calvary for you, and I want to be the center of your life. I want to be the focal point of your life. I want to be the focus of your life. Yes, there is sin to the left and to the right. There is knowledge of good and evil all around you. But if you focus on me, if you set your heart towards me, if you are one with me, then I will lead you through this life. Even though it's on every side of you, I want to be in the midst of your life. I want to be this focal point. I want to be the center of your life. Amen. But he's going to give you the choice. Every day is a choice. Yes. Right. Every single day is a choice. Yes. Who you're going to serve. Yes. Are you, we going to serve the Lord or are we going to serve our flesh? Are we going to serve, actually, it's not even just every day, brother. It's every single minute. That's right. That's right. Amen. 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 Yeah. When somebody you don't like walks up to you. And they telling you something you really don't want to hear. Yeah, you can have that choice in that moment. Am I going to be like Jesus? Am I going to show them Christ? Am I going to walk with the Lord in oneness and wholeness and completeness at this moment? Or am I going to blow my top? Amen. Amen. And look, I'm going to tell you I don't do both. <laughs> you squeeze me the right way, you might see Something you don't want to. But you know what is lovely about the Lord? That the moment that that happens and the convicting on, power of the Holy Spirit comes, I can turn around and say, Brother, I am sorry. That was not Christ-like. That was not right. Please forgive me. Right. And guess what? I'm free then. Hallelujah. And how he takes it, well, the Lord deal with his heart. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's how you relinquish control. I can't control how he responds to me. Right. He can't control how I respond to him. Right. But God wants to teach each one of us 
how to be one with Christ, that we be one with one another. And he said that we are to love one another. I'm going to let you know. We have some personalities in here that we all probably ain't going to like one another. That's right. But God is going to give us a supernatural love yes. for one another. Yes. yes. Look, me and I tell each other all the time, man, well, if we were on the street together, we probably would have killed each other. Right. But we're best friends in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff and I definitely would have killed each other. <laughs> but Jesus has brought us into one. Yes. Yeah, man. Danielle and I definitely probably would have killed each other, too. <laughs> And we've had some bumps in the road. But God has taught us how to love one another yes, and how to be yes, friends. Yes. He's going to teach you how to love the unloved on. one. He's yeah. going to teach you to ha how to heal the broken. Don't be the, the Samaritan I mean, that walks by in the Samaritan story and just walk by the other side of the road. Oh. Please be the one that grabs the oil and pours it on their wounds. Yes. Please be that one. And you know what's even better is when you're that one, when it's somebody you really don't get along with. All right. That's when the anointing really shows up. Is when you make a choice to serve him despite how you feel. Wow. Amen. Naya's mother always told <laughs> I love her to death, but she was serious. She would love the Lord and she was serious. And she would say to us, it not, it's not about you. That's right. She would tell us, all the time, it's not about you. Right. It's about Jesus. Amen. So put your feelings on the back burner. Put your views on the back burner. Put how you feel on the back burner. Amen. Put what you think on the back yeah, burner. Because yeah, it's yeah. not about you. Right. I don't care how long you got to go or how long suffering you got to be or you got to have patience and you got to be kind. She, she'll tell us real quick, it's not about you. Go serve. Amen. Yes. Amen. And we heard that over and over and over and over and over again. Hallelujah. So now we know it ain't about us. Oh, that's right. Amen. That's right. And even us wants to rise up at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And say, I want to do this, I want to do that. I want it this way, I want it that way. They should have played it that way. He should have said it that way. Well, if you know what, then you do it. Amen. And you're going to find out real quick, being the pastor of this church is not all it's cracked up to be. And being the worship leader is not all it's cracked up to be. And being the boss man of your business ain't all it's cracked up to be. And being the wife or the mother of that person ain't is all cracked up to be. Amen. Come on. Mercy triumphs yes. over judgment. Yes. Amen. Mercy. And I'll tell you what, the Lord is good and faithful to put you in the position to get you to know what it's like to be that person. Come on, man. Come on. You don't understand why people make decisions that they do, and that's okay. You might not even understand. I'm sorry. I'm not, like, really defending Pastor Matt, but I am all at the same time. Because you might not know why he makes decisions about this church that he does, but you're not in the background of everything. Come on, right. Come you don't on. know the, all the undercurrents of everything that he makes a decision that's for. It. So you know what you have to say? Okay, Jesus, I forsake all. Mm. And Pastor Matt is yours. Yes. And he is the shepherd of this flock. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to take my hands off of this. And I might not agree with everything Pastor Matt does, but you have placed yes. him over this church. Hallelujah. And you have chosen him. So now you speak to him. You. Yes. Pastor Matt hears from God, y'all. Yes. Okay? Yes. He hears from God. So if you want Pastor Matt to make a different decision, then you go before the Father. That's, That's it. Amen. That's it. And you pray that he hears. Yes. Right. And then that's what you do for your friendships. Because yes. look, I can tell Naya a thing or two. <laughs> and she might not hear me. I like to use Naya because that's my best friend. She, she, she won't get offended. But I might tell her something and then all of a sudden she'll come up to me two weeks later and be like, Becky Sue came up to me at church and told me so and so and such. And I could be like, I just told you that! <laughs> Three weeks ago! You didn't get it? Now, now that's real good with spouses. I'll be like, Jeff ain't in here. I wish he was in here because I ain't talking about him. But I'll be like, he comes and tells me, I got this revelation from the Lord and did it. And he'll spill the whole thing. I told him two years ago. And I'm like, yeah, great revelation, babe. 
Pastor Matt, and he's not going to change me. Amen. And, and it, we're not going to change our children. You can pour into them. You can lead them. You can be an example to them. But guess what? They still have their own choice. They still have to choose the Lord, too. Amen. As much as I love McCartney and Ezra, and I wish I could put them on my back and just be like, we going on with Jesus. And for the season of their life, I am to a degree. But there's going to come a time that they have to choose who's they're going to serve. Yeah. And even in the school right now, they have to go to school. And they have to choose. Am I going to serve Jesus in school? Or am I going to... There's choices our children have to make, and we have to make the best decisions for them. Amen. Right, Gabby? Going into high school. Gabby's going to have to choose. Right. Our little firecracker Gabby, people getting baptized in the Holy Ghost, yeah. speaking in other tongues. And she's still going to have to go to high school and still going to have to continuously choose who she's going to serve day by day. Right. Oh, God, and he's going to keep her. Amen. Yes. I told Gavin the other day, I pray the Lord use you to light that school on fire. Yes. I pray that the Lord use you and keep you. Let his face shine upon you. Let him go before you. You keep, keep speaking truth. You keep being Gabby. Don't be trying to be someone else. Don't be chameleon, y'all. Yeah. Amen. That's right. That wasn't in my notes, but that's good. <laughs> Don't be a chameleon. Right. Be you. That's right. right. Look, some people get uncomfortable with me when I'm praising the Lord, when I'm praying. Some people get uncomfortable with Danielle. She prays, she moving and hollering, dancing, lying. <laughs> she doing a jig. She running across the church. Pastor Matt screaming. <laughs> get uncomfortable. But God made us who we are. And God made you who you are. So you be the best version of you that you can be. And I'll be the best version of me that we can be. And guess what? You can begin to embrace other personalities and people's differences. And that's what makes the body of Christ and relationships in Christ beautiful. Because I can look. If my big toe is cut off, I'm going to be in a load of trouble. I need my big toe. I, I, I need my pinky finger. Yeah. I need my elbow. I need my knees. I need it all. I need the head. I need my nose to smell. I need. We need every single part of the body of Christ. Be careful who you chopping off and cutting out. Because you don't know if that person is going to be somebody you need down the line. And all of a sudden, you're the reason they stumbled and they back out there. Don't be that person. God, help us to be merciful and not be those people. God, help us to not have judgment, oh God. God, help us, Lord Jesus, not to walk in destruction and be beguiled by the enemy, oh God. God, help us to change. Yes. Help us to be not misled. Hallelujah, Jesus. He said he put him in the midst of the garden. I want to speak to the men. Can I speak to the men this morning? Come on. He said he put man in the midst of the garden to what? To dress it and keep it. That word dress means to work, to serve, and to be a bond servant. And that word keep means to hedge about, to guard, to protect, to be aware. This was, this was before Eve was even created. He took man and he put him in the garden and he said, I want you to dress it. That means I want you to work. I want you to serve. I want you to labor. I want you to be a bond servant of me. And I want you to take care of what I have given you. And then he says, I don't want you to just dress it, but I want you to keep it. I want you to defend it. I want you to protect it. Listen, women, we are strong, yes, but the man is the head and he is supposed to protect and he is supposed to defend. And sometimes it falls short. God is calling you to be men of God. I need my husband as much as he ruffles my feathers. I need him. And I need him to protect and to defend. I need him to dress and to keep and to our household. I need him to pour in to our household. I need him to be the father to those children and pour into them so they see a godly father and a godly example. And if your children are older, you still can do it with them. And if you don't have any children, then grab the children in the church and be the man of God to them. Yes, yes. Look, some of the, some of our kids don't have that. Come on. Come on. And they need spiritual leaders and spiritual fathers. Amen. Yes. 
mean, I, I watched Jeff walk up to Gabby yesterday and ask her and talk to her and, and, and pour into her and encourage her, and that encouraged me. Yes. God has called men to tend and have responsibility of their sphere of influence. And then it said, the Lord God commanded me and charged man, saying, of every tree in the midst of the garden you may freely eat. I never noticed this before, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know where Pastor Matt is, but God commanded Adam, I don't even see him talk to Eve. Am I wrong? I'm right, right? Yeah. He talked to Adam. And he said, I charge you not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Eve got swept up. I'm just wondering where Adam was. Actually, he was standing there because he handed him. <laughs> She handed him the fruit. Right, right. Where was his right. keeping? Mm -hmm. That's good. Where was his protecting? Mm -hmm. And I want to say this. We as children of God, if we don't have that man, that covering, you have Jesus yes. covering you. Okay? okay? And also, you as a woman of God are supposed to tend to your flock and take responsibility at, for your flock and your relationship with the Lord. That's it. Yes. I believe that a man is supposed to be spiritual initiator. Amen. That doesn't mean a wife does not have influence and tend to the garden. And it doesn't mean the wife is not spiritually equipped. Because right. you know I stand. Strong, bold, courageous women of God. Amen. Amen. But implementing spiritual principles in your home is the job of the man. And is the woman to support and follow through. That's right. God helped the breakdown of the family unit. Amen. God, and listen, I'm speaking to men in here today because I want to encourage you in what your job is to do. And if you don't have the family, so to say, in the household, then you reach out to those you do have a sphere of influence of. One of the most attractive things, and I, and I spoke to this men's home one time, and there was 40 men in there, and I told them one of the most attractive things of a man of God is when he worships. Be a worshiper. Of your house. Be a worshiper in your house. Let them not just see it in the church house. Let them see it yes. in your house. Yes. Yes. Let them see you break open and read the word of God in your house. Let them see you praying up and down the halls of your house. Yes. Yes. I tell you last night, Jeff said the baby gave him a run for his money. And you know, I was in here praising God. I needed to get mine. Sometimes you just need to get yours. Okay? And when you need to get it, get it. And he said, the baby gave him a run for his money. And then he said, I, so I do something at night where I put her stars on the ceiling. And then I play baby worship. And I've been doing it since she was born. So I've been instilling this in her since she was born. Well, he said, he said, I remember the baby worship. He said, I changed her diaper. I'll put her in her, her little, she likes this furry blanket. She's going to be so bougie. And, and he said, I put on the baby worship. And she just calmed down, fell asleep. That was a father tending to his child and using the means and principles of God to do it. And, the ba and there was peace that came. And there was comfort that came. And God equips women. There's not a man in the home to do the same. Yeah. To do the same. To be an influence, a protector, yeah. and a keeper. Yeah. And not only that, but keep your heart. Yeah. Yes. Keep your heart. Dress it. Protect it. Tend to it. And keep it. Yes, Let there not be a breakdown between you and the Lord. And then he says this, 2.17, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for thou in the day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. I want to say this, God is always giving us instructions, and he's always giving us warnings. 
He does. He gives us warnings. That check you got in your spirit about that thing that you knew you should have said or did, and you got the check before you did it, but you did it anyway, that's saying, God, beware. God's saying, beware. Beware. Don't go there. Don't, don't say that. If you say that, there's consequences. If you choose that, there's consequences. If you go that way, there's consequences. You shall surely die. The word of God says it. The, the word of God says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is life in Christ Jesus. Jesus' gift of life. But he said, but beware, because the wages of sin is death. And if we go in a sinful way, what does it produce? It produces spiritual death. It produces spiritual separation from the Father. And you know what sin also does? It produces a separation of you and the people of God. Because all of a sudden you know that you did or went or said or had. That, like It could be even something simple as gossip. All of a sudden I'm talking about Danielle and Naya. And now I'm over here hanging out with um, Yvette and... Now I don't want to be around Danielle and I because I knew I was talking about them. You know what I'm saying? So there's a separation of the people of God because we're sowing discord. God doesn't want that. He wants unity and wholeness in the spirit. And he says, look, that's going to produce spiritual death. You know that the Bible says that there's death and life in the power of the tongue? Amen. We have to watch what we say, y'all. All right. Watch how you speak to each other. Watch how you speak to your pastor. Watch how you speak to your, your parents. Watch how you speak to your children. Watch yes, how you speak yes, to yes. each other. And you know what? It's a spiritual thing. So you could not even be saying it to that person, but you could be saying it out loud. And all of a sudden, there's death that's coming. Wow. You don't have power to make things happen. But you have power to speak life to one another right. or speak death to one another. God, guard our tongue. Because, you know, the enemy came in and said, you shall not surely die. And that's exactly what he does. You can do that. You won't surely die. You can date him or her. You shall not surely die. You can divorce your wife. You shall not surely die. Mm. You can go commit adultery. You shall not surely die. You can lie about that. It's just your taxes. They'll never know. Mm. You shall not surely die. You can lie about that. You can lie to your children. You shall not surely die. One of the things God did with me when I first got saved was he constantly overhauled my honesty. Because I was such a liar. I really was. And the Lord convicted me every chance. I mean, it could be the littlest thing. It could be the littlest thing. I would, I, it would come out my mouth. I'd be like, that's a lie. <laughs> I was so used to lying. I don't know if y'all ever been there before. Yeah. But as an addict, I was so used to lying that lying just became second nature. And God would, I mean, when he really was starting to do a deep work in my heart, he would, I would, I would go back to Naya and be like, that whole story I told you, girl, it was a lie. <laughs> and she's like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, it's just bad. Like, it's just, it was just something I did. And then eventually, so at first, the first couple times, she was like, surprised. And then the next time, I'm like, Naya, she's like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> And eventually, we've been friends for a really long time, y'all. This is like 12, 13 years ago. But, but eventually, the Lord would convict me and it wouldn't come out of my mouth. I'd be like, wait, it's a lie. Why am I lying? So silly. Tell the truth and shame the devil. Tell the truth. But, and you know what? I, I know, even with my kids, I'll tell them, Ezra, tell me the truth. Because if he tells me the truth, I'm more apt to be merciful. Mm. Now, if we lie and we're trying to cover things up, we're trying to hide things, you're going to get in trouble for what you did and the lie. Right, right, right. And that's, <laughs> and that's the truth. I just learned that if I would just swallow my pride and humble myself and tell the truth, then it would be a lot better 
for me. Even, even so little as recently I went to Walmart and I had all my stuff and you know they got the self-checkout. Now, why we check out our own stuff, I don't know. I need a paycheck from Walmart. Right? We'll be stocking shelves, he says. Might be true. Grab five, five items, stock them today. But I walked out and there was something underneath all of my groceries that I didn't pay for. And look, at this time I was like eight months pregnant and I was tired and I was waddling to the car and unloading everything. And then this little thing was at the bottom of the car. And you know I did not want to go back. And I said, oh. Now look, I used to be a thief back in the day too. <laughs> back in the day, that would have been a no-brainer. I would have the car. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant and tired and everything hurts and this stupid little thing in the bottom of the cart is there. And I walk back in, I waddle back in Walmart. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, but this was in my cart. And she's like, oh, it's okay, no problem. But you know what? It was a testimony of God. Because I actually was talking to that woman about the Lord. Wow. So it was a testimony that I came, because you know 95% of the people got in the car. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and now this pregnant woman waddling back in for like a $5 item talking about, I'm so sorry, but I had it in my car. But you know what? If I would have gotten that car, that Holy Ghost would have been all over yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And then I would have been sowing something in my family that that's how we do things. Wow. And wow. that's not how we do things. Yeah. Come on, come on. You hear what I'm saying? When our, when our children or people around us hear of us gossiping about other people, then guess what? They think that's how we do things. Uh, you know, I I'll go we'll go to the kids and be like, I'm sorry, I lost my temper. I'm sorry. I'll apologize to the children too because they need to know that that's what you do when you mess up. Right. That's how you restore relationships. If you were nasty to that woman in church, then just humble yourself and go make it right and just say, I'm sorry, Sally, that I was like that. Right. Go make it right. Amen. But listen, if everything that's going on is in your heart, you let God deal with it. Don't tell Sally that you thought her haircut was bad and you, in your heart you were sinning against her. Don't do that. I've seen that done a lot. Oh, yeah. You go and unload on somebody the way you felt about them. Mm. And call it Jesus. And, yeah. And say, I just want to make it right. No, you just wanted to tell them your opinion. All right, all right. You just really wanted them to know how you felt, and then you're going to cloak it and say that you're sorry. Mm. That's not the God. That's That's right. Right. Don't go unload somebody all your feelings about how you feel about them, and they don't even know it. Let God deal with your heart. Amen. Get in your prayer closet. Amen. And let God deal with some of that in our hearts. Amen. God wants to restore today our relationships. But the serpent is subtle, he's cunning, he's crafty, he's clever, he's indirect, he's in disguise, he's difficult to understand, he's hard to see, he's hard to perceive, he's slick, he's sly. And he comes in to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's what Eve had said. She said, he beguiled me, he led me astray, he mentally tricked me. He got me to be disloyal. And I want to tell you this. The enemy did that to Jesus in the wilderness, too. He tried. He didn't do it. He tried. He tried. He tried to trick him. He tried to tempt him. It said that he, he tested his faith in the wilderness. Anytime you said, now why did Jesus go to the wilderness? To fast and pray. Yeah. What well, Y'all came here last night. Y'all lifted up your hands. Y'all saw the face of God. You're here again this morning. You're setting your face towards God. And you let me tell you, don't be beguiled or led astray when the enemy comes in and tells you to go in another direction. And God's not going to do what you asked him to do. And he's not going to be there for you. And he's not going to deliver you or your children. He's not going to set you free. He's not, he, he doesn't forgive you. He's going to begin to lie to you. Because why? You set your face like a flint toward Jesus, yeah, 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 and now yeah. he's going to try to get you off track. Right, but I want right. to encourage you this morning. The, what Jesus did is he said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall I serve. That means that Jesus himself used the word of God to combat the enemy and to chop down the lie. And he said, him only shall I serve. I'm going to take this that today I will not be led astray and I will stand on the promises of God despite what it looks like, despite how I feel, and I am going to believe him. Yes. And when Jesus did that, the Bible 
that I do not understand and I am not pleased with. But I can discern this is the enemy. Why? Because the character of the situation is destruction of the family unit and destruction of relationships. And that's the enemy. You can sign on the dotted line and believe if it's come to destroy, it's not God. That's right. If it comes to steal your peace, it's not God. That's right. If it comes to remove your comfort, well, that might be God. <laughs> God make you uncomfortable and get you somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, right. he will. He will. He'll shake everything that needs to be shaken. Come on. He'll remove people out of your life. Look, if God's the one doing the severing, you better just let it on go. Yeah. Come on, sister. Let it on go. There's a difference between God severing a relationship and the enemy destroying relationships. That's Look, I knew I was supposed to marry my husband. I knew it. I knew it. So that now that everything in hell comes against us, I still know I was supposed to marry my husband. That that was of God. And God is not trying to sever us. The enemy is trying to destroy us. I know that I'm supposed to be friends with Naya. I know that. So any other time, I, she get, rubs me the wrong way. I say, Lord, thank you for my friend. Yes. <laughs> Glory. I know that I was supposed to be part of this church. Amen. So any time that Pastor Matt rubbed me the wrong way or stepped on my toes, right, right, right. I would say, Lord, thank you for my pastor. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know what? Try that. Amen. Amen. Next time somebody gets on your last nerve yes, yes. and rubs you the wrong way, start thanking the Lord for them. Right. Yes. right. So I'll I tell you what, there was a woman in ministry that I was actually, and she it actually, the enemy was using her to, di to distract me. He was using her to get me to focus on the wrong things. Mm. Okay. But when I began to thank God for her yes. and pray for her, the Lord changed my heart. Right. He right. might not have changed the situation, yeah. right. but he began to change my heart for how I responded to the situation. Yeah. So no longer was I being tossed left and right in my emotions and all over the place and, and complaining and murmuring and trying. No, I was steady, Hallelujah. <laughs> stable. Yeah. And that didn't mean it didn't hurt at times. That didn't mean she didn't rub me the wrong way at times. That didn't, but it meant I was I was just flowing as humble before the Lord. Steady, steady, steady. She wasn't going to get me off course. Steady. Look, the enemy will allow people to come your way to get you off course. He will allow, he will send people your way. God will allow it, but the enemy will send those your way. He will send lies your way. He will send people your way to get you to doubt God, to get you to doubt what God said to you. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. She knew what God had said. She knew he said, don't eat of the tree because she repeated the word of God back to the devil. She repeated what God had said. She knew what he had said, but she decided to give in to that anyway. Well, let me tell you, God said he said will pour out his spirit. He will give you another comforter. He will give you one who lives inside of you to overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. He said he has made you an overcomer. Thanks be to God who always causes me to triumph. You've got to know what you have in him. And know when the enemy is trying to get you off course. Discern it. Be aware it. Pinpoint it. Know it. Say, I know that that's not God. Because yeah, that is Satan's character. Yeah, Look, I know we got a lunch and a barbecue and slides and kids and all kinds of different things that we're going to do. And I'm sorry for holding you so long, but I'm not sorry. Amen. Because God wants to teach us something in our walk. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to be soldiers in his army. He wants us to fight when the enemy has come. Look, if, if somebody busted in the doors right now, will we be ready to fight? Amen. I'll tell you what. 
If somebody came after my baby or came after those babies over there, I would be like a black mama bear ready to rip somebody's head off. That's how we should be when the enemy is coming in, coming after your faith, coming after you, coming after your mind, coming after your heart, coming after your emotions. No, I'm going to stand. I'm going to fight with the word of God. I am not going to be misled. God loves me. God is good. See, that's another trick of the enemy. God doesn't want good for you. He didn't give you that yet. He, he, he didn't do that for you. He blessed that person but didn't bless you. He, and, and then all of a sudden, you he getting you to, to look at God with a twisted eye. Forget about Sally down the street. Now we're looking at God twisted. God didn't do it. God ain't going to do it. Where's God now? God got them this, but why couldn't he give me that? God did this for them. God did that for them. No, work out your own salvation with fear and trouble. What's God doing with you? Maybe if we got our mind and heart off of Getty, you could get your mind and heart on Jesus, and then Jesus could prepare you for what he wants to give you. And get you ready for what he wants to do with you. Because God, he's got good things for all of us. Why? Because he's a good father. He said, if you ask for him for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. I tell you what, even with my baby now, I mean, I'm learning a lot from loving her. Because, I mean, I was here, and I'm like, what's up? As soon as that whimper comes from your heart, the Holy Spirit is there. Look, with a pacifier to soothe you. With a word to speak to you. I put my hands on my baby's face and it immediately calms her. Because she knows mama's there. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. Yes. The moment we whimper, mm. he's like, I'm here. I'm here. And the devil's in your ear mm. saying, well, your God ain't there. Mm. He's not going to do that. <clears throat> he can't forgive you for that. Mm. Are you kidding me? Mm. You're too far gone now. Mm. You believe the lie. I'm here to tell you that it's a lie. I'm here to tell you, pinpoint, tactics of the enemy. Yes. Know that you are in a war over your soul. You are in a war for your soul. You're in a war for your family's soul. You're in your war for your friendships. Look, I tell you what, I got up on there. The Lord told me, go lay hands on Naya and lay hands on your dad. And I don't know what the Lord was praying through me because I was speaking in tongues. But I tell you what, I, I'm not a big crier when it comes to being in the presence of God. I don't know why, but I just don't. But last night, the presence of God was so strong, all I could do was weep. And it was like one of those really ugly cries. <laughs> and that's okay. I'm okay with that today. Okay? And the Spirit of God was all over me, and He was just praying through me. Why? Because God has taught me to listen to his voice and to go do what he's asked me to do. Right, right. And I don't know what God was praying through me for Naya and for my dad, but I know that it was powerful and I know that it was strong and I know that it was good and I know that it was his will for me to do that and I know that he was praying through me good things over their life and he was fighting for them and he was breaking through, okay? And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Don't allow the enemy. Look, I tell you what, I charge you this. Next time you feel frustrated about somebody and they are on the stage or they're over here or you see them say can I pray for you Hallelujah. Mm, that's good. I charge you to do that go pray for that person that you don't like and watch God move Amen. watch God move because the enemy wants to break down the unity but God is saying no I want you to be unified what are we going to do when We've been praying for revival. We've been praying for God to send the people.
people. We've been praying for all this. And now all of a sudden the broken of the street come in. And we're over there being catty about stuff. And all they hear is the, the negative of the church. Oh, help us. Help us. Help us. Then when, when the hurting and the broken come in, we're not just putting gasoline on the fire. They're going to be like, they're just like the world. What's the word? down the aisle, you're not going to kick her out. Jesus. Mm. You're like, could you walk better down the aisle? That was not a good enough fault. Mm. Jesus. You're not going to tear your bride down if she was walking down the aisle. My Lord. You're going to be in awe. Preach. My Lord. My Lord. And the groomsman is waiting. He's waiting. He's saying, I want my bride. I want my bride and I want my bride as one. One bride. Mm, yes. And he's going to use us to be one. Yes. Jesus. Naya, if you would come up, please. Hallelujah. There is many different examples in the Bible that the enemy came in and beguiled great men of God. Great men. But I want to encourage you with this. Joseph was taken from the pit to the prison, to the palace. But you know what? Jealousy, jealousy in the house of God brought division and tried to murder Joseph. But Joseph ended up in the palace. God had a plan for Joseph. Don't let jealousy bring division in the house of God. Don't let jealousy murder each other in the house of God because one day, one day that we don't know of, that person okay, is going to be the one in the storehouse pouring out to you. Pouring out to you. Abraham was beguiled by fear of man. He went before Pharaoh and said Sarah was his sister, but it was his wife. 
He feared man and he lied, but then God turned it around and, and, and Abraham said, I believe God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He was the father of nations. But there's so many different aspects in the word of God that the enemy can use different things to mislead us and misdirect us and, and beguile us and get us off track. But God ultimately, in the end, even with Samson, Samson made a Nazarite vow, said, I will not drink, I will not cut my hair, I will not touch dead bodies, I will not marry of another nation. And guess what? He did all of those things. He did all of those things. He gave up his strength. He gave up his relationship with God for all of those things. And his strength was taken from him and he was blinded. Let me tell you this. The enemy will use different things to blind you and to keep you blinded. But when he repented, God said he restored his strength and he destroyed all of the Philistines. There's so many different examples in the word of God. But in the end, God won every time. In the end, look, we're, we are an imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God. So my job today, this morning, was to encourage you that as you are traveling through the progressive act of sanctification, as you are being changed from image to image and glory to glory, as you are pursuing Christ and moving towards him, the enemy is going to try to mislead, misdirect, and get you off track and bring forth death into your life. But I am here to tell you that God has a plan for you. God's plan for you has not changed. He is not done with you yet. He's not done with your family. He's not done with your children. He's not done with this church. He's not done. He is not done yet. And he's not going to be done until the day of his coming. When he said, bride of Christ, come. Bride of Christ, rise up and come. And I don't want to be embarrassed when he comes back and say that we were not one. I can't wait till he comes back and he says, come. And then he can look at us and say, I see my bride as one, as whole, unified, whole in me. God said that he would put enmity between the woman and the serpent, between thy seed and her seed, between he would bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The enemy this morning has might have been coming against you and your family, but I'd like you to stand up. Stand up this morning. If this is you, if you feel like the enemy has been hostile towards you, has been coming in, there has been lies on every side of you. Things have been in derision. It's been in dysfunction. Things have been out of control. You feel like things are out of control this morning. But God says, I am in control. And I want to bring you back into perspective and back into view. I will tear down every lie and tactic and scheme of hell that has come against you. When I said it was finished, it was finished on Calvary. Every lie against you right now will be brought down. Every tactic and scheme of hell, every tactic that has tried to bring you to the lie, I speak truth over you this morning. As we begin to worship him, I want you to just forsake all and cling to him this morning. If you want to come down to the altar and receive God,